And thanks everyone for, for coming. And uh, I've got uh, a little bit on the company overview and then uh, we'll go into the technology and then I have a demo at the end. And as Fred was saying, just feel free to ask questions as we go along. Um, we have a new version of a uh, major release of Quantastore, our, our uh, software defined storage platform coming out at the end of this, uh, towards the end of this year. And uh, we're taking it up another level with uh, a whole uh, layer of, of analytics that I'll be talking in, uh, about in the end. Uh, but uh, a little bit about the company to start. Uh, I started the company uh, towards the end of 2009. I was at Citrix and uh, working <clears throat> on integrating enterprise storage systems into Zen Server. And I've been in the storage industry now for about 20 years. And a lot, a lot of that time has, has been working with enterprise storage systems and inter integrating them with other products. And so we've, the, the focus has all, all been about how do you eliminate complexity? How do you go and take things that, that administrators have to do manually and just fully automating and making them just disappear so that it's, so that, that it's a lot easier to uh, do the, the business, the day-to-day -day business of either backups or storage management and provisioning and things like that. And a lot of that went, knowledge went into the design of, of, of Quantastore. So um, uh, after we got started, uh, it was about a year before we, we had our first uh, version out. And about a year after that, um, we started selling Quantastore through the soft layer cloud, which became IBM Cloud. We've been in the IBM cloud since 2011. We've got uh, deployments across all their data centers worldwide, a lot with the Fortune 500. Um, we're headquartered in Bellevue, Washington, but we've got our team kind of spread all over the world with uh, uh, sales support and engineering. Um, our team is made up of a lot of uh, folks from, that I worked with back at Veritas, uh, but also from Brocade and Isilon and Citrix and Symantec. Um, we've been at it for nine years now, so a lot of the patents that we filed in the early days have now uh, come together and uh, we've got a few more uh, pending uh, that are in the queue. Our, our, our go-to-market strategy is all channel-based. So um, a lot of companies haven't heard of us uh, uh, because we, we, we're, uh, we're really focused on uh, large-scale enterprise, a lot of uh, focus on security and, and managing data at scale. So we don't really focus on the small business market. And, uh, and so we, we uh, uh, have, have found a niche here with, uh, with the hyperscale uh, software-defined storage. Um, all right. Uh, so, I, yeah, as I mentioned, I've been in the storage industry for a long time. And uh, the, uh, the focus uh, with, with Quantastore was to bring to, to the market a product that would make, take, take storage management from a full-time job and make it a task, make it so that IT generalists can go and get the job of, of storage management done and fully automate a lot of those tasks that before were all manual. And uh, when I was at Citrix, I saw that, that that had been done already with the compute platforms. You take a look at what VMware did and what uh, Citrix did with Zen Server and Microsoft did with Hyper-V. They went and they built this hypervisor platform that would let you cluster boxes together and manage everything as one on the compute side. But nobody had really done that on the storage side. And I also had this belief that really Linux was this bulldozer uh, that was just going to just take over everything, uh, partly because of seeing this happen. And I felt like the same thing was happening on the file system side because uh, some of the things that happened at Isilon around 1FS caught on in the open source. There's several open source projects that started doing scale out file systems. And I felt like, let's get behind that movement and let's go build the, the enterprise software defined storage platform out of those technologies and then contribute back to them to make them better. So, you know, when you see something like this, what was happening in the supercomputers, uh, in, you know, innovations with supercomputers, Linux took over here. You know, when you see something like this, this is an indicator of an inevitable market takeover. Same kind of thing with like Android with our, with our uh, cell phones, you know, it had a really small market share here, but you see its growth and it's basically taken over the entirety of the cell phone market. And here's another indicator of inevitability. Take a look at that. This is a survey that the OpenStack uh, community uh, did uh, in 2017. <clears throat> What's interesting here 
is that you can see that 65% of all OpenStack deployments are on Ceph. They're not on NetApp, they're not on EMC. And here you can see the portion of this graph, the 6% here, that's the stuff that's proof of concept. That's all the new deployments. The number of new deployments on Ceph is more than the entire, entirety of the market that EMC has in the OpenStack community. Was that, were there respondents <coughs> in that uh, OpenStack users though? You know, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I think so that- be a bit soft Yeah, definitely. The, the OpenStack community leans a lot more towards using open source software versus enterprise uh, storage systems. But part of it has to do with those market forces of, hey, if you're an ISP and you go and try to build your business around a platform like EMC or NetApp, you don't really have a business because the cost of the storage is so high that you're not gonna be able to compete with Amazon. And I think that basically happened at Hewlett Packard. They built that Helios cloud on top of NetApp. It's too expensive. You just cannot compete against you know, free uh, when, you're, when you're paying such a huge premium for the storage. So <clears throat> this is just a, 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 a sort of a, a piece of the storage market. You know, Ceph RBD uh, storage, you know, if you went and took a look at the same graph, uh, instead of the use case being OpenStack, if it was VMware, this would be a tiny little uh, sliver close to zero. And that's because the RBD protocol, it just isn't supported on VMware. So, <clears throat> But it is a, yeah. I think that's a bit of an unfair chance in lots of respects because um, you have to give respect to the, the wider market in, in terms of everybody who's not using OpenStack. And it doesn't yeah. really show the fact that OpenStack requires you to have lots of people who are very skilled at building and managing and nursing that environment, which is something they'd be very comfortable with with, with the storage platform. Um, and that isn't necessarily something that's scalable across many enterprises. So in, in actual fact, Safe isn't going to take over the world compared to everybody else's storage platform. It might be a niche within that particular environment, but not necessarily across the entire industry. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. But That's the exactly ones were more indicators of things that were. What's that? But the previous ones you referred to, the Unix, Linux, yeah. one, for instance, that is indicative of the enterprise having been taken up. So, so it's a different comparison. <clears throat> so what I'm, what I'm going to assert is that Ceph can't do it on its own. And because it's not really a storage platform, what, what you've got there is a huge ton of complexity. Just like what you were saying, you need an army of consultants and engineers to actually make Ceph usable. And you do, you've got a whole bunch of command line interfaces that you have to use to maintain it, and that's risk. And so that's why you don't see a lot of large enterprise using it unless it's to build their backend cloud. They're not going to expose that to an end user. It's just way too much risk. And so that's what we're all about solving at OS Nexus. This is just a little uh, article I saw where it was showing how long it takes to get up to speed with OpenStack. It's this, this fellow wrote in saying, hey, if you want to be an administrator, it's going to take you six months to a year just to get up to speed with the technology. And Ceph is no different. It's super complex. There's a lot of knowledge that you have to build up about how to distribute the data and crush map management and all these other things. And so I kind of assert that there's a lot of software-defined storage products out there that are really just file systems, but they, they, they market themselves as software-defined storage. But the, and our view of what software-defined storage is is an all-encompassing thing that everybody can go use, just like an enterprise storage system. In fact, it is an enterprise storage system that's just purely software-based that anybody can use as simple as public transportation. And so I'll... I'll uh, I'll kind of follow on that analogy with this. So this is sort of all of the components that Quantastore builds on top of those file systems. So using the train analogy, we build uh, systems that can scale to over 100 petabytes uh, by, by essentially eliminating all the complexity of those file systems so somebody doesn't even know, need to know any of the Ceph terminology. They don't need to know how to use ZFS or any of those things. If they've got some basic storage knowledge, they can log into the UI, they can leverage those technologies and get the benefit of it without having spent even a moment looking at a, at a piece of documentation about those underlying pieces of tech. So what is Quantastore? So it's our software-defined storage platform. Um, it's Linux-based and it installs on bare metal and uh, all, all major server platforms. So what we've done is we've, instead of just you know, doing uh, the, the verification of the platform on one uh, a bit of hardware like uh, HP or Dell, we've done it on all the major manufacturers. And that's because 
when we, when we talk with our, our customers, when we go uh, uh, to uh, see what their needs are, they all have different platforms and they don't want to go, if they've got HPE, they want to buy more HPE. And if we're really going to do what NetApp, <coughs> not NetApp, but uh, VMware did with <coughs> making the compute platform completely uh, flexible so that you can pick whatever hardware you want, you have to do the same thing with the storage side. So we've got certified reference configurations across Cisco, HP, Dell, Lenovo, Supermicro, Intel, Whitebox, they're all covered. And that way the customer gets to pick and, and reinforce what they've already decided on buying for their compute side. And it also makes it so that they can interchangeably use that equipment as compute and storage. So if they need another uh, storage appliance, they can just take a server, turn it into a compute node and, or storage node and, and push it into what we call the storage grid. So this is kind of the, the big problem that we solve. If you're buying uh, a Nimble appliance, uh, you're getting just block. If you're getting a NetApp, is file uh, with a little bit of iSCSI capability. Uh, three par, you're getting block. Up here with Scality, you're getting object. So these different storage challenges that, that they have are not just that the products only do one thing. You've got a forklift upgrade that those vendors are going to enforce after three years. And that's painful, and you know the capital expenditure that it costs because they they basically mandate that you've got to go replace all the kit because it's aged is uh, is is not the way that that we find companies want to manage their hardware. So by making it pure software and making it so that you can mix and match different types of hardware within the storage grid, the customers that have control over that cycle for one of the, uh, for the first time versus these uh, these proprietary platforms. The other bit is security. How do you go and manage security policies across all these systems? You've got completely different models. Some of them are like all or nothing. Uh, that was one of the big challenges we had at Citrix. We wrote this, this system that would automatically provision storage from the storage arrays, but the administrators came back and said, no, you can't have the admin password to the box because if somebody breaks into the hypervisor platform and gets the admin password, they could delete everything. So Quantasor has a super strong security system that lets you, uh, it, it's basically multi-tenant, lets you group resources together and, and follow the rule of least privilege and assign specific uh, user, users to specific roles that have very specific set of permissions so that you don't have to give anyone any more permission uh, uh, or, than, than what their job requires. And it's not just operations, it's also visibility to the set of objects. So if you've got storage resources for the finance department, you can have those completely hidden from the engineering department. So you can collaboratively manage the grid, you can delegate things in, in a whole new way. So uh, just just kind of summarize all of that. Um, the, uh, the, the grid technology I'll, I'll dive into next, but uh, you know, being able to control when you replace the hardware, when you grow the hardware. Um, it just, it's just re really critical to ensuring that you get the best price. We're a software vendor, so we only sell the software. The customer is always getting street price on their hardware. And, uh, and then we've got distribution in the US and, and uh, in EMEA uh, with uh, Exertus Hammer as our primary distributor in, uh, in EMEA. So this is what it looks like to build a grid. Is it a, a site license or a capacity license? Or? Yeah, that's a great question. That's another area where we've tried to disrupt things. If you go and you take a look at how um, companies charge for storage today, um, you know, you, you buy a small appliance, it's going to have a really high cost per terabyte. Um, and as you buy more and more appliances, you're pretty much paying the same price as you do at, did at the beginning. And what we do is uh, we charge based off of raw capacity, but it's the raw capacity for the grid. So when the customer's at, uh, every time they buy additional capacity for their grid, their price is going down. So it's an equation that's basically uh, like a downward hockey stick. So when they go from uh, one petabyte to two petabytes, the second petabyte they buy is about 10% less. And as they continue to grow to you know, 16, 20, 30 petabytes, it just continues to go down a bit more. A lot of the cost savings comes in within the first 500 terabytes to a petabyte. And so it's kind of like a site license model. You know, you just, you can have, you, if you buy a petabyte and you want to deploy it across 10 appliances or two appliances, it's completely up to you. You can deploy that petabyte on all flash or uh, 
uh, all platter or a mix of the two. Um, you can put a terabyte of RAM in the boxes or uh, 64 gigs. It all, you have complete control over all elements of the hardware and that just gives companies the ability to just make ultra fast systems as well as uh, very fast uh, throughput archive systems and, and uh, they don't have to think about, ah, oh, I, do I need to buy this tier or that tier or, oh, I need these features because that's the other thing we do. All the features are included. High availability, encryption, compression, remote replication, uh, the grid technology, everything's included. So you don't have to think about, oh, did I buy that extra license? There is no extra license. It's all what, there. What is the license? Is there an open source version, for instance? Yeah, you, you know, because we build upon uh, a lot of open source technology like Linux, we give out a 60 terabyte license to the community for free. So you can get a three node Quantastore grid. You just download the ISO image. It's the same software that we use everywhere. And uh, you get uh, a two year key that you renew just by coming to the website on the community edition. And so that's our way of giving back to all those open source developers and um, enabling them to go set up their own Ceph grids for development and other purposes. Thank you. Yeah. So what we're showing here is uh, uh, some, a couple of, these are a couple of servers with attached disk enclosures. So this is a scale-up style configuration. Um, and then this is a, a, a cluster pair as well with all flash. And what the grid lets you do is no matter how many appliances you deploy or where you deploy them, um, they all get managed as one. And so uh, here's another uh, pool of flash and it's got a replication schedule to send some block and file storage to there. But we can also set up object storage clusters, and that's whereas these are using the ZFS technology underneath, these are using uh, Ceph technology underneath. And then you can set up remote replication uh, with that as well. And all of these can be in different data centers. And uh, so this can be in Stockholm, London, New York, Amsterdam. And no matter where you log in to uh, any, uh, with, uh, with your web browser, you see the entirety of the grid. So the whole thing is, is uh, built upon our, our grid architecture, so all the systems intercommunicate with each other. Um, there is a, a designated master node. If it gets turned off, another node becomes the master automatically. Um, and so the REST API, the command line interface, uh, the web interface is available at all nodes at all times. There's no extra software to install. So a lot of platforms, you have to go put a virtual machine onto some, some, machine, some other node to go see what, what uh, what's happening with all the systems and then maybe it only gives you monitoring information and not management. Quantastore, everything that is in the web interface, uh, which allows you to fully manage the platform, uh, is also available in the command line and CLI. So, our, our, and, and REST API. So our REST API today has over 500 APIs. You can set up an entire Ceph cluster in three commands. Uh, you can set up a ZFS pool and start provisioning storage for an end user and two commands. So that's the magic that the, the REST API that we've built uh, uh, does so that <clears throat> administrators can just take everything up a level. What used to take a long time uh, now is done really quickly. And I've got a demo that I'll do at the end. We'll set up Ceph. You know, setting up Ceph might take you know, a, a skilled engineer a week to set up and tune and optimize. Um, we're gonna do it in five minutes. Um, Enterprise feature set. So we've been at it for a long time. So uh, everything from you know VMware integration and certification, compliance with HIPAA and CGIS and NIST 800-53. We're going through a FIPS 140-2 certification right now, so we can be used by more government deployments. Um, everything from audit logging, global namespaces. Our, our call home system ties in with a whole host of different uh, mechanism. So if a disk drive goes bad or somebody pulls a power supply on anything in the grid, it'll send you a, either a Slack message or an email or an SNMP uh, uh, note. Um, and uh, so there's just a whole bunch of different ways that we've tied in with call home mechanisms. And this is really what SDS is all about. It's not just a file system. It's about all those layers above the file system that make it a turnkey management platform. And when you take a look at just in terms of just sheer code, uh, the amount of code that goes into building an SDS platform is much larger than the file systems that it sits upon. So this is a quick uh, view of the UI. I'll bring this up in just a minute. Um, we've got 
sort of a dashboard section here that gives administrators a quick view of whatever they select. So if they select a pool, they'll see the IOPS and throughput and latency information. If they clicked on a block device, they'd see that for an individual block device. Um, we've tried to just streamline this so that when you log in, this says storage systems, so you'd go in there and set the network settings. Um, then here you'd go and create a pool of storage and then you can start to provision file and block. And a lot of the more advanced configuration steps like setting up a Ceph cluster is out here. Setting up remote replication is here. Um, Cloud Containers does a NAS gateway mapping so that you can access Amazon storage as local file storage. So there's just a, a whole host of features that are in the product that just make it easy for uh, customers to handle complex workflows. Because it's not just about uh, object or file or block. Companies need all three of those things, and they need to bring them all together, uh, whether it's doing some very fast transcoding and then pushing it out into object storage afterwards, um, or running their virtual machines on all flash uh, storage and then migrating uh, backup copies into object. And that's, and that's why we've got two file systems in the platform. Uh, ZFS gives us it's kind of a scale up uh, capability that has ultra low latency that you can't achieve with scale out technologies. And the, the, the converse of that is we have the scale out technology in there for companies that need to be able to scale to huge capacities and where the performance benefits of scale up uh, <clears throat> are not outweighing just the ease of management and scaling by being able to add individual nodes and having the advanced auto healing you features. You mentioned three earlier, now you only mentioned two. What's gone? What yeah. Have you, what have you dropped? I've dropped Gluster. Okay. Yeah, and we have it in the platform. I just don't talk about it as much because our long term move is towards more and more Ceph integration. Uh, so the Gluster technology has much more maturity as a scale-out NAS, uh, but we generally take customers towards our ZFS for all the file and block, mm -hmm. and then we use uh, Ceph for object. Right. And there's some variants where we've had to, to uh, do some scale-out NAS with Gluster, um, but what's happening nowadays is that companies are requiring that all their object storage acts like file storage. And you can't, object storage has this kind of set of, uh, uh, of rules around how you use their, the, use the object storage protocols and how those things are designed so that the data is immutable. And so you end up having to like upload the objects again. Um, but for some uh, workloads, it works just great. And so that's also coming to Quantastore, the ability to access all the object storage as NFS in a scale out way. Mm -hmm. We have it today through those NAS gateways. You can set up a little bridge to, uh, to access the object storage as file through one of our, what we call a cloud container, but we're doing a more advanced integration that scales across all the appliances uh, so that you can access it as, as uh, NFS that, and SIFs. That's the, the, the multi, the multi uh, kit that they've set for your appliances. Yeah, exactly. And that's, again, we're not reinventing the wheel. We're, le we're leveraging some technologies like Ganesha NFS underneath to make all that happen. Well, Steve, uh, yeah. question. Uh, tell me about your thinking behind the rationale um, of deploying on bare metal rather than deploying as a VM or a container or a, micro or a set of microservices. Yeah, I, we've seen some companies go and, uh, and, and, and build virtual machines that then have to be set up to provide like iSCSI and NFS protocols. And I kind of look at it like the, the storage platform should be completely uh, unto itself. When you buy and, and rack and stack your storage system, you should just be able to go use it. Whether or not you've got a Windows client or uh, a VMware environment and all that, you shouldn't have to go install virtual machines uh, in, inside of your virtualization environment. I just look at it like you're polluting the compute side and having to do this all this extra complexity when you have to go set up virtual machines in order to use the storage. I kind of look at it like here's a great uh, you know, electric car, but you've got to park it in your living room, right? Your living room's the compute side. You know, you, the garage is where the car goes, right? The, the, uh, so it's just a, uh, yeah, my view of it is, is that the, the storage should just be, you should in install it on the bare metal and you shouldn't have to do anything else after that. Is it, does that answer what you're after? Well, only sort of. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a question of, 
if I want to buy your your software yeah. and license it out, I also have to buy metal to yes. go with it. Yes. As opposed to using my existing metal and deploying as a set of services. Actually, we do both. So when a oh. customer has uh, hardware that they already want to use, right. uh, then what we do is we go through a certain process. They go and send us the build of materials that they already have. We tell them what components they need to upgrade. We send them back a solution diagram that shows uh, what it's going to look like after the upgrade with all the usable capacity and all of that, and they're good to go. Um, a lot of customers will start by setting up Quantastore as virtual machines. So you can install it not only bare metal, but you can install it on Hyper-V and Zen Server and VMware okay. and set up a, like a, a multi-node cluster. And we have some customers that actually extended their grids into virtual machines because they didn't want the cost of buying hardware for a, D, for a, a DR site. So if you've got um, a, 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 you know, your headquarters, you've got a petabyte of storage, but you've got a remote office that needs uh, 10 terabytes, um, you don't want to have to go ship them a box and power that up and deal with all that. You just spin up a virtual machine running Quantastore, add it to the grid, and the grid just manages it okay. just as if it was another another system. So the bare metal is, is kind of a, a recommendation for yeah. the, the, the primary yeah. controllers? It's, yeah, exactly. And it's because of the scale of things, right? When you want a petabyte of storage, you don't want to manage that through mm -hmm. a virtual machine, yeah. right? That's where um, nowadays we, we do a lot with... Um, Intel white box and HDST uh, JBOD, those can hold 1.2 petabytes in one shelf that's for you. Uh, so just with three of those JBODs and, and two head units, we're at 3.6 petabytes. And so we've got customers that have those distributed across like eight to 10 different data centers and managing you know, upwards of 30 petabytes of storage. So you don't do that with virtual machines, yeah. So this is how we integrate with the hardware. Um, we have plugins that tie into every major enclosure and every major server and uh, every major RAID controller and uh, HBA. So you're not just getting a storage plat software platform that's blind to your hardware. It goes in and discovers the hardware and it goes, and when, you, when you've got a drive that goes bad, this box is gonna go red. Uh, to indicate that that disk went bad. This is in the top drawer of this Dell 3060E. It's all had a little dashed line around it indicating that it already blinked the light. So the service guy just needs to go into the lab or the data center rather and pull the drive, put a new one in and, you're, and, and it auto heals. How so can you, How can you do that? Normally, one of the things we're seeing is that VMware, for example, multi-billion dollar web, yep. massively profitable. But only sp only sprinkles its special blessing on a very limited number of servers for vSAN. Yeah. So vSAN requires some mystical process involving priests, virgins, and unicorns. Yeah. And only the blessed servers come out the other. And funnily enough, they're very high price ones. But that's a story yeah. about that. Why is it that are you able to just say I'm giving hardware support on a very wide range of servers because it's not very hard? Uh, it's a lot of work. Um, you have to, um, you know, get those those systems. We work a lot with those hardware companies. Like we went through IVT certification with Cisco. There's several weeks of work there because there's all these peculiarities uh, that, to the hardware that needed to be tied into our software. The same thing goes with HP um, with like the D6020s. We tried to use our standard technique for activating the LEDs. That didn't work. We had to go and do some work around. Um, so VMware can't, but you can. Yeah, we That's do a lot point. of work. My point yeah. here is that a big, multinational, highly profitable organization has restricted capabilities here. Yeah. A smaller organization can... So when VMware, next time VMware tells me that, that you know, it's a mystic process and it's very difficult and costs a lot of money, I'm going to go like... Well, yeah. remember, Greg, in mystery there is margin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. you can use uh, Linux driver and VMware has to rebuild the yeah. driver from scratch. This is probably the big difference. Uh, yeah. I, I spent uh, most, most of my time at Veritas Software working on integrating third-party storage arrays. And so this was just kind of a repeat of that. Right. This is, okay, it's not a, uh, an array, it's a JBOD, it's a server. Um, and so all the kind of techniques that we use uh, at Veritas kind of came to play here. Mm -hmm. And then it was just a matter of, okay, after it's integrated, figuring out how do we want to go and put stress load on these systems to make sure they're all yeah. certified and, and proper. And uh, we've got great relationships with uh, the various uh, vendors and that's really critical as well. You know, when we run into something uh, that's wrong with the firmware, they're just right on it uh, and, and turn it around. We had 
a, a deployment uh, on the HDST J bots earlier this year, and uh, we got a firmware upgrade in a couple of weeks. Took care of the customer. Wow, well, a couple the patch of weeks. Out. Oh, that's not very fast. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's fast for a hardware vendor. Exactly. That's yeah. The point is yeah. The hardware vendors can come. Yeah. Get yep. So, Steve, how many deployments have you got? Over 500 today. So we've got a lot of a lot of those are with IBM, but in the last couple of years we've been really growing outside of of IBM, and today over 50, over 50 percent of our revenue is now coming from outside of IBM. But if you had 500,000 deployments of the software, would you still be in the same situation with the HDR with the HDL where you'd keep it as wide? Because I think you'd see more corner cases at scale than you would do with only 500. Cases. Well, we 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 give recommendation. The, the hardware is just constantly moving, and you can't tell an HPE user, hey, go buy the Dell box. It just doesn't work. So it might get a little bit more narrow on the white box side, but when it comes to the major you know, uh, server suppliers, we'll always have that support there. But I think that's, the, I think that's part of the answer to Greg's um, hmm. question, is the fact that because VMware has got so many more points, it yeah. gives me that for them. The corner cases become more apparent because they stand out more because they're simply at higher scale than you might be at the moment. And Maybe. You might find if you were yeah. at their scale that you wouldn't be able, you wouldn't be operating the same size of HCL because you would you would be seeing as many problems in your support environment and not cope with it. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I mean like yeah, we run into all kinds of interesting things and that's actually a great segue to kind of where we're headed with, with the product. So imagine how much, you know, uh, that, that exact scenario. Where is your cost coming when you go and deploy uh, a, either virtualization environment or a software-defined storage uh, system, and it's across all these different sites? There's a lot of work in terms of what the solution engineer and the, you know, the, the, the pre- and post-sale uh, engineering have to go do, and a lot of that has to do with just configuring the networking properly and uh, making sure that they've set all the ports properly, jumbo frames, uh, network bonding, LACP, all of these things really go and create a lot of challenges. And that's not even getting into, did they apply uh, proper security rules? Did they have inconsistencies in their network configuration? And then the performance tuning, did they performance tuning? Did they tune the flash storage like it was um, uh, uh, sequential HDDs? And so that's where Quantastore is going, is we're building this sort of AI uh, that's not really AI, it's more like an expert system, and it's essentially going and analyzing all the various things across the grid. So if you've got 50 boxes and you go and tell a storage administrator, hey, go figure out what's wrong, or hey, is everything set up, or are we following the right security practices, are we GDPR compliant, right? Um, all of that is going into our analytics system so that you just click a button and you get a report, and it tells you everything that's misconfigured, everything that should be optimized, everything that's a suggestion on how to go and improve things. Uh, things like, hey, you, you set it up, and um, uh, this has happened uh, where customers like, hey, I, um, I'm not seeing the performance. You know, what, what's going on here? And all the traffic is being routed through the one gig management interface, right? And you go, oh, well, you're not making use of that you know, 10 gig or 25 gig interface because it's not configured properly. And you can, you can put into the, the analytic system something that says, wow, 90% of your traffic's being driven over the management interface. So that's what this, the, the support engineer would be doing. That's all going into the analytic system. So we're basically mining all the, all the knowledge that came out of the support organization over the last several years and putting that into the analytics. And that way, uh, we'll be able to turn those those tickets around even faster, but also we instantly make every customer an expert. They get to press a button, and it, it's like having an expert go and have analyzed their grid and put two to three hours of work in it, and they get it back in two seconds. So just, and just how far are they Sorry. How far away is that? What's that? Is that existing now? Yeah, it's it's in in a minor way uh, at a command line command in the product, but we're building that into the user interface. Interface for Quantastore Five, okay. so that's a big push uh, for uh, so where we're taking the platform. On that? Yeah, we're we're working on enhancing it. There's about 150 checks that it needs to make, and we've got a lot more. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do to get all those checks in place. So we've identified everything that we want to go do, and now we're just going through that implementation of of putting all of that into the analytic system. 
it's system, it's network, it's a lot of uh, checks. That's, you got it. That's why it's different because you are not in, anymore inside the storage. That's right. Yeah. Phase. It's it's, it's a different kind. It's, it, the storage depends on the network, depends on the system, depends on so many things. That's right. Most of of all is the misconfiguration, but. Uh, yeah, it's a holistic view yeah. of the storage environment. You know, uh, even things like you can have where uh, maybe uh, the various nodes can communicate with the master node, um, but then they can't communicate with each other. And so if the master node failed over, you need to know that, that the, all the networking's uh, configured, right? So there's just so many things that have to be checked and they're just kind of difficult to put a, a human in there to go check, you know, 500 things on, on 50 servers in a grid. And so that, that, that is where our, our focus is at, is to just up-level storage and make it, um, make it turnkey at that. It, we, we make it pretty turnkey at that scale, but just sort of building in that storage, that storage engineer into the product. And I haven't seen that before in the industry, and I, I, I think that that's going to be a, a, another big differentiator for us. Steve, just to finish that, so yeah. that's something that um, Nimble did. 10 years ago, and that, okay. was, that was in the base of their product when they first started. Okay. So the idea of collecting metrics and doing analytics on it was something that they um, they sold the company and effectively to HPEs with the Infosat product. Yeah. It's not to say that people weren't doing that previously, and if you look back at 30 years ago, yeah. on dial back, everything was doing sending configuration information and alerts and all the rest of it. Yeah. The difference is obviously nowadays is that when you get a certain amount of scale, you can start doing inferences on one platform which allow you to work out that somebody else's problem, that platform might have a problem. Yeah. Now, um, I see two issues there. First of all, like you have a bit more of a difficulty there because uh, on the one hand, you're not deploying consistent hardware. So like customers are not deploying the same thing in every location like they would be if they were taking something from a traditional vendor and therefore making inferences becomes more difficult for you because you can't highlight as easily a particular fault of the product. Second, um, there's a whole there's a whole range of people um, who are deploying things like Ceph and, and CFS yeah. out in the infrastructure who are not collecting this information and centralizing it. That would actually be quite useful. And in fact, that's something that the industry should be deployed, but isn't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I think uh, it is a big challenge um, for us. And so that's where a lot of the architecture of how we've designed Quantastore comes into play. The grid architecture lets us see all information from all nodes, and then we put into the object model all those key pieces of information, like is this uh, storage you know, SaaS-based, or is this device uh, PMEM, or is it NVMe, uh, and all of that sort of stuff. So if somebody's trying to use you know, a particular type of storage for the wrong thing, again, the analytics system can, can gather that information and process it. So yeah, the, 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 the challenge is sharing of information across the systems in a very uh, efficient way. Um, and, and again, it goes back to the grid architecture. When we want to design a new feature in the Quantum Store, we have a lot of automation that goes and lets us go from API to implementation in a matter of minutes. And that, that's because we introduce a new object, tying that into the grid, distributing it across the grid and all that. It just, it's just um, the way it was is built at the beginning. I had to kind of do that at the beginning. I needed to eliminate every single engineering task I possibly could just to make it repeatable in the early days and because we had such a small team. Uh, and that's really paid off dividends. And I kind of look at it like when you're building a software product, it's kind of like building a building. Uh, you have to pour a really strong foundation. You have to put great rebar into the building. Otherwise, you're only going to be able to go up a couple of stories, and then you'll, you'll get cracks in the foundation. You'll see it starting to lean like a Tower of Pisa. And we've built a really great foundation for the product so that we can go build a great skyscraper. And I feel like we're only at like the third or fourth floor at this stage. But the rate at which we're engineering and innovating is, is faster than, it, than it's ever been, even though we're nine years into it today. All right, this is a, our, our kind of our first grid dashboard. Um, so this kind of gives you an overall view of all the systems and how much free space there is. So if you've got 20 pools of storage and you know, however many petabytes. So, so we yeah. Just, yeah. To come back to talk just yeah. before, just uh, to, to become an AI system, 
not anymore an export system. That is to say that you have to put some much more program inside just to uh, discover uh, if you've got a new uh, customer, for example, and just your product can uh, discover all uh, the configuration, misconfiguration or whatever, and just propose yeah. them a better way to, to, to put uh, the light on all over the networks to get the right storage uh, yeah. Exchange at the right level, for you, example. I don't I, know. No, no, you got the right idea. I think that it starts yeah. by getting the 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 various, you know, hundreds of checks in place. But then that AI system comes in and starts doing meta analysis on it. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I see this problem and this problem and this problem. It means that, not really what those those initial indicators mm -hmm. are. But it needs to sort of distill the data into some number of data points before you can then go and apply something like a, a, a neural net or a GA or something like that to it to go and take it up yet another level. So we're kind of starting with the, the building blocks to go and be able to do that, that level yeah. of, of uh, uh, intelligence into the platform. So later, perhaps you, you will do something in this way? Yeah, in the future, yeah. yeah. That's the next step? Yeah, and the grid is really like the first step because if you only have insight into one box, if you're doing sort of the traditional um, you know, uh, way that, that enterprise storage systems are deployed, you're getting a box or a cluster of boxes. With Quantastore, you're, you're getting all the boxes across the enterprise, across all your data centers, and so you can start to do some level of analysis that couldn't really be done before. Um, yeah, this just kind of, we're trying to just create like some top level dashboards to sort of give you a view, okay, how much capacity is free in the grid? Are there any areas that have problems? If it's all green, you're all good, you can log back out. Um, and uh, this is just, if you're trying to figure out where's all my space being used, this gives you a view of that in terms of file block and object storage. The little yellow here means it's file storage, green means it's block. So you can, you can really easily go and take at a glance, hey, do I need to buy more storage and do a bit of capacity planning? And then these things just kind of go and show you everything's online, how many systems are online, how many pools you've got created, and then these tiles go into the individual systems. And so where we're headed with these is to show sort of the real-time stats, uh, some interesting stuff there, and have more of a list view and some, some other ways to just kind of uh, you know, summarize the, the, uh, the grid information in, in uh, a little bit more uh, uh, consumable fashion. So Steve, um, yeah. When you say grid, I can see how that would be the case with Ceph. How is it um, a grid when you're using uh, CFS in that instance? Yeah, great question. So Quantastore doesn't just manage one Ceph cluster or one ZFS cluster, it manages all of them. So you can set up 10 different Ceph clusters inside of the grid. And then ZFS, we've built our own high availability and remote replication uh, technologies that layer on top of, of ZFS. We've also built an encryp encryption system underneath ZFS. So when you set up ZFS with, with, with Quantastore, it's 99% it's of the time you're setting it up as an HA cluster. And so you can, typically those are two node clusters, but that's also a direction we're headed where you can set up three and four node clusters so you can get additional nines of, of high availability. So if- And each of those clusters will be a ZFS instance? Uh, inside the cluster, you can have as many ZFS pools as you like and they can move back and forth. They're almost like virtual machines, right? Yeah, yeah. The pool it has an IP address or a group of IPs assigned to it, and then you can move it back and forth between nodes. So that gives us high availability for scale up storage. With the Ceph stuff, high availability is just built into that architecture. So if a node fails, uh, you, all the other ones are still serving the storage. And so our cluster management uh, technology that's built into the grid uh, lets you create these clusters to put virtual IPs, not just for ZFS storage, but also for the Ceph and the Gluster. So if a node goes offline, the users haven't lost access because they're, they're, that IP address is just going to float to another node. So I guess when I, when I think of the term grid, I tend to think of something where I can access anything within the grid and the data spread across the grid and if any node dies or something happens, there's no sort of real disruption to that process of, to allow me to continue. Yeah. I'm not sure how you can do that with ZFS to that degree because you're replicating point to point. You're not really, it's not really an N-way um, replication in a grid sense, is it? for that block storage? It's asynchronous N-way replication and cascading replication right. um, for the remote replication well, schedules. So it's not sync, so it's not... It's, it's not async. Data accessible from any particular place yeah. at the time. 
With Ceph, we can do kind of continuous streaming, and so it gets pretty close to synchronous, and there is also a way to do it synchronous with Ceph. So Ceph is really kind of the long-term way forward. It's got the ability through just its architectural design for us to do certain things that ZFS can't. But ZFS, uh, I, I still am a strong believer that, that scale-up architectures are still going to be needed for the long term. They've got a lot of benefits in terms of much lower hardware drag. When, you, when you're going to buy a, uh, a system and you're going to do scale out, the minimum you need is three servers, but to really get performance, you're going to need five or six of them. And then you're building two networks, the front end and the back end, so you've just doubled the number of switch ports, maybe tripled, because sometimes you need more bandwidth on the back end than the front end. Like at Isilon, they put InfiniBand on the back end because they needed the, the performance for, for, for 1FS. Um, so that hardware drag is a barrier for uh, some deployments, and the high latency is also a barrier to the adoption of, of, uh, of scale-out. But we, we get good, good performance with scale-out. We're doing a deployment this week that was hitting around 10 gigabytes per second on eight nodes. It was on some Dell equipment, and uh, it's 1.6 petabytes roughly. And so they're just uh, a whole bunch of these you know, standardized Dell uh, R740XDs. Uh, with an NVMe card in there. So you, you, you know, th that's the great thing about the scale out is you can get more and more performance, but it's not, it's not single stream uh, increasing. Uh, in some cases it is, if you use like an RBD that does a scale out versus, uh, you know, communication versus iSCSI, but for a lot of workloads, you're connecting to a single IP and then it fans out. And so uh, again, there's some benefits to the scale up architectures for, you know, it all really depends on the workload. And it's great that we can just do both, you know, and we get to look and analyze what's the customer's workflow, how, how, what's gonna be best for them, and it might be a combination of the two. A bit of object storage that scale out, a bit of block storage that scale up, uh, file storage that may be one or the other. Yeah. Let's see, I got, okay, demo. How are we on time? Yes, we got. Yep, so quick minutes. question. 25 yeah. minutes to go. Um, 25, perfect. Um, yeah. so, um, so I understand the focus on like, you know, large deployments and, you know, this is next generation storage, but still, do you, uh, can you do something for you know, all those enterprises that are struggling with the you know, storage assets and do this yeah. thing? And then you come in and you say, oh, you stand up this new architecture, but they say, oh, but we've spent, you know, 50 million on EMC and that's up there. Yeah. HP, can you sweat those assets? So the question yeah. is, can you help us migrate off of them and yeah. then repurpose those systems and reclaim capacity? Because that's been you know, for 50 years. Almost. That, that is a great question, yeah. And we do that. Um, it's not that often, but um, you can uh, not only connect Quantum Store to uh, you know, uh, disk expansion units like JBOD, mm. uh, you can also connect them to like a Nimble. So if you bought a, a all uh, block storage uh, product like a Nimble or a 3PAR, um, oftentimes what happens is the, you know, the IT staff says, gets, gets asked, hey, I, okay, uh, glad you bought that new you know, 500 terabytes of storage. We need um, you know, three new network shares. And they're like, whoa, I, I, I didn't buy file storage. I just bought block, right? And so what do they do? They go and they set up, uh, they give some block storage to a Windows appliance and now they've got a whole other headache, right? Because now the Windows appliance is a single point of failure. Maybe they map it out through a virtual machine and then they've got performance issues and, and all, all kinds of stuff. And so what, what we do for those customers is you can just take Quantastore and deliver some block storage to it. And you can make a Quantastore VM or have it de be dedicated hardware and make it a NAS head for those traditional storage arrays. So what we prefer is mapping it in via fiber channel. It's got just better, you know, lower latency and, and uh, some uh, nicer characteristics uh, than, than iSCSI for that back-end storage, but we also support using iSCSI as, as uh, back-end storage for Quantastore. So you can take and, and get more, get a higher return on investment on those block storage devices by taking a server or a pair of servers um, or a virtual machine with Quantastore on it and, and providing it as a NAS head. And, you could even set up object storage. You need, you know, uh, again, you map it through and you can just reuse it again as a file block and object. Yeah. Do, do, do you have a specific 
positioning, if someone comes to you saying you know, that they're, they're interested in going down the SDS route um, because they've heard all these wonderful things that all of us in this room might have written, um, but, sorry, Ben, how would you position against the other major SDS players? Yeah. Especially the open source. Models? Yeah, I, I think that it's for. For so many organizations, OS Nexus is just a total no-brainer because what happens is when you, you talk to a Red Hat or a SUSE or some other open source vendor, um, they come in and it's consultant wear. It's like what we used to sell at Veritas software back in the late 90s. And you are instantly limiting your market to Linux experts, Linux gurus, people that are completely comfortable going and writing bash scripts and automation and, and, and all of that. And th those folks are really expensive, and they're a risk to your business because if they're on vacation and you've got an outage, what are you going to go do? Or if that, that critical couple of people that are maintaining that storage go take a job someplace else, you're just up a creek. And with Quantastore, it's not only turnkey, you've got 24 7 support that goes and manages all that. And then I think the other big thing is, is that Ceph is just a file system. When you go and take a look at what you need in an enterprise storage platform, um, that's that, that box I showed at the beginning. So, um, demo, yeah, thank you, yeah. So I've got three virtual machines running here on my laptop, and um, it, might, it takes a few minutes to set up uh, Ceph, but I'm just gonna take you through that. I've already booted the virtual machines in the interest of time. And uh, we'll log into. So this is the user interface. It's as I mentioned, it's accessible on every um, IP. Uh, you can scope that to specific IPs and all that sort of thing. But uh, if you don't, uh, default password is just password. And we're logged in. And <clears throat> sure, we'll save it. So here we see a three-node grid. If I click on uh, any of the appliances. Uh, you can see the real-time stats of uh, how much memory and CPU utilization they've, they've got. Um, and this is where you go in to go configure like the network ports and all of that. Um, the stuff that we are showing with the enclosure management is all in here. These are virtual machines, so we're not going to see uh, hardware enclosures attached. The pools of storage, this is where you go to create like a ZFS pool. Um, this is uh, like a single dialogue. You just indicate what storage you want, disk drives you want to use, and, and you can enable encryption with one checkbox. You click OK, uh, and, uh, and you've got your pool of storage. And we've, we've really worked to streamline uh, this process so that it's a lot easier than the NetApps and the EMCs. When I was analyzing how that process worked with uh, NetApp, with ONTAPI, and that the user interface, way back when. I'm, I know they've improved their UI a lot since then, but it was 17 to 18 clicks to go provision block storage and go assign it. And so we were focused on how do we go make that three clicks? What is the absolute minimum? How do we make it so that the platform just does the default things and they can go and adjust it to do more advanced things, but make it so an admin can get in and out and be done really quickly. So this is, this is to go create a pool. Um, I'm gonna actually skip this because I wanna use the disk drives for Ceph, and so we'll go over there and uh, start setting up stuff. So this tab here is where we go set up those scale out uh, block and object uh, uh, storage clusters. And uh, uh, underneath this is using the Ceph technology. So you pick a front end network. I'm gonna use the 56 network as the front end and use the back end network of uh, 40. So all uh, scale out architectures do this. If you've got, um, uh, a whole bunch of inner node communication that needs to happen. Uh, if you put it on the same front end network as uh, uh, the same network that your clients are coming in to go access the storage, you run into problems when you start doing rebuilds, like a drive fails, you start needing to shuffle data all around the, the, the cluster. And so the, the practice that's generally used across the industry for everything that scale out, whether it's Scality or Isilon or Quantastore, uh, uh, is uh, to go separate those two. So what I've done here is I said, hey, we're gonna use this, uh, this network 56 for the front and 40 for the back. We're gonna name the cluster just Ceph, and we're picking three of the appliances that are in the grid. This is a 
small grid, uh, you could potentially have 20, 30, up to 64 hosts here as our, as our tested limit. Um, but uh, you can just keep creating more and more clusters. So let's go ahead and start creating a cluster. And what's happening right now is that the grid's doing a coordinated transaction across those nodes to completely set up Ceph and, and put three monitors out there. So what we're, what we're doing would typically take an administrator a fair amount of time. Not only would they have to have installed Ceph and uh, started to you know, prepare the nodes and write some scripts and all of those sorts of things, uh, Quantistor just does that as a single API command. So everything that we do here with each of these dialogues is actually just an API call. So you don't have to use the web interface. It could just be a CLI command or a REST API command. So Steve, when you deploy yeah. things like this, it's great when it all works and it's packaged and you know, nice and simple. Um, and having that technology to do that is good too. Yeah. Because uh, it takes it away from that end user to have to know what's going on. But usually the problem is when it breaks. And yeah. so it doesn't quite go according to plan or it, it breaks after halfway through the installation because you don't know what the script's actually doing. You don't really know what actually it was yeah. trying to achieve. How, does, how do you manage that from a support perspective in terms of somebody who might ring up and go, I'm on the phone and I've got to point seven and it just seems to have stopped? What sure. Do I, what do I do? That's, that's what our 24-7 support team is there for, but it's also a big part of what we do in engineering is to go and uh, do... Uh, a, a strong matrix of all kinds of things and do the wrong thing, right? Set, try to do uh, set up things in a way that's not right and then essentially block the user from doing it the wrong way. That's a big part of the value in having an enterprise platform is that it doesn't let you shoot yourself in the foot. So and is then, there something like a, a pre-flight checklist that would look at the, the configuration and say, I can't start even running any of this because none of these boxes are ticked? Oh, yeah. You're not showing us that? Specifically, or um, it does when you go and tell it to go do something, and it, and you don't have the right bits uh, or the right configuration in your place. It'll just pop up a, a a little message saying, "Hey, you can't do this yet. You got to go do this other thing." But that's a great that's a great thing too. You know, um, if you want to go set up Ceph and and you know you you haven't watched the video or or, or whatever on on YouTube, you can just go click our getting started and go to the tabs here for setting up object storage. And it's like a bouncing ball. You do this step, this step, this step. So it takes you through those four steps and explains what you're doing at those four steps. So we just did this first one, setting up the cluster. Um, we're going to go add data devices, and then we're going to activate S3. So, um, and the system is, is uh, inside of the, of the core service is um, all these just uh, ton, there's just a, a large number of these monitoring components that are actively monitoring everything. The disk drives, the network, Ceph, uh, RBDs, uh, Gluster, and so we call these manager components. And so there's this huge breadth of, of manager components that are actively monitoring everything. So if somebody went into the box and just pulled a drive, you're going to get a little warning, an alert that goes out saying there's an OSD that went offline, and it's going to go figure out which drive that was in which chassis and start blinking it. So there's there's active response when something goes wrong, um, and you know if if they run into something where it was like uh, some something where we could have uh, put in an extra check to go and have prevented them from doing something wrong. Technically, that's a bug. So we put it in as a bug. We fix that in the next release if it's a dot release and it's turned around in a couple weeks. So that's that's a lot of what gets built into the product is just, hey, um, it, it's just got to be turnkey. And that's there's a lot of work to go and smooth out all those rough edges of these underlying technologies. What happens if I want to build it into something like um, Ansible and, you, and have, a, have the environment fully automated? So I don't, I don't have to manually do this every time a customer. Yeah. I have thousands of customers on my private cloud. Yeah. I don't have to do that every time a customer comes and says, I need my little virtual storage environment. Yeah. I want to put that into automation. Yeah. How, how can I do that? That's uh, through, we've got uh, two new Ansible modules for doing the block storage provisioning and assignment, but we've got a whole bunch of the APIs. We've got uh, over 500 APIs, so we've got a lot of work to do in terms of Ansible module uh, development. So I can't quite do that yet. You can do it. You could do uh, a Ceph setup with um, a Bash script in three lines. Right. So there's a command line and there's a REST API, but all, all the work to tie it into Ansible uh, is, uh, is being done. And it just calls our REST API. But it's not, it's, that doesn't sound to me like that's a lot of work for somebody to do themselves if they really wanted to. Oh, yeah, completely. Yeah, yeah they can write a little script. Um, we, we do that as part of our support organization as well. As, 
you know, if a customer needs some help learning something about the product or need, just needs some help, you know, like, hey, I haven't replaced the drive before. Can you walk me through it? We include that. And if they need some help, hey, how do I go write a script uh, that does this? We just give them some guidance. Here's what that's roughly going to look like and send them some, some bash or some curl commands or, and that kind of thing. And it's great for them and it's great for us as well. The more that they tie into the platform, the more, the more and more they leverage it, the, 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 the stronger our relationship with the customer. So yeah, so um, let's see here. We've set up the Ceph cluster. Let's see, how are we on time? Uh, we've got until 11.15. Okay, perfect. So now we're gonna go and pick uh, disk devices. And this is, um, these are called object storage daemons or devices with, um, with Ceph. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to pick, I've got a whole bunch of virtual disk drives set up. And I'm going to take these three here that are 10 gig. These are on three different boxes. And we have to go and give it a journal. These would typically be like an NVMe device or an NVDIM device. We're going to choose those as our log devices. And uh, Qantas Store will uh, go and slice those up into pieces that can then be used by all these other devices, which are going to be used for data. And so we're just going to send all those over. And uh, we've picked our data devices. We picked our journal devices. Uh, we're good to go. So uh, Quanta Store is now uh, doing another coordinated transaction to go and initialize all those journals and then assign those journals out to the newly created OSDs. And so we've just set up Ceph. Uh, all the clustering, all the object storage devices, now we can start to leverage it. It's going to take a little while. This is another thing that, that we do because we have this grid technology that's uh, you know it's event driven. Uh, the events get pushed into the UI, so we get to show real time everything that's happening in the grid, who's logged in, who's doing what, and everything is audit logged. So uh, part of our NIST 853 compliance was to go and make it so that every single thing was audit logged, and not only audit logged, but in this sort of JSON CEE format, so um, organizations can go and collect that and 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 verify, you know, if, hey, if somebody go, went and deleted some piece of storage, you've got to know when did it happen, who did it, all that kind of stuff. And so that's all built into the system. So, so you've, got, you've got automated routines, basically, is it? Are just doing all the work of configuring set in the background, pushing out these commands. You got it. Replicating it over your grid and so You got it, and yeah. And then we put all of the Ceph configuration in yeah. exactly the same way that an administrator would do. Mm -hmm. Because we don't want it to be in some sort of cryptic file that they can't go and, and do some extra engineering around. So there's cases where we have to do some custom, what are called crush map configuration settings. Those will eventually come into the UI, but today, you know, a support organization might need to assist someone if they've got a multi-site uh, replication, synchronous replication set up. Uh, and so you can just go in there and, and look at like the Ceph comp file and things like that. And it just is totally readable because it's exactly the way they would, they would have designed it themselves. So um, it's, uh, while it's working away at that, um, I'm going to go, it's right here complaining that I didn't set the domain suffix on these, on these nodes. So I'm going to go and adjust that setting real quick. And if I didn't do this, uh, it would have complained when I went to set up the object storage. So uh, that gets to what Chris was getting at. Well, what if they, if they do something wrong? Like setting up the, do not having a, uh, a domain suffix is one of those gotchas that, you know, Ceph won't play nice if you haven't set this up on, on the various boxes. Okay. And let's see how it's coming along. I'm going to clear these. Uh, these uh, there's two, uh, some more tasks running to set things up. I'm going to clear the tasks that are completed. And this is one of the really nice things about the, the again, the grid technology and the coordinated transactions is you're not creating OSDs one at a time. If you've got a thousand of these drives across a really large cluster, the last thing you want to do is do that one at a time and spend hours and hours and hours doing that. And you certainly don't want to have to go develop the scripts to go do it, you know, and, and have your script break and then re-verify re it and then not have set up the journals properly, all of that. It's just fully automated. Everything is just being done for the administrator. 
and they just have to wait until these tasks are, are, are done running. And it's in parallel configuring the OSDs across the various nodes. So those are all getting uh, uh, done more quickly that way. It does take a minute or two. Any other, any other questions about what's happening here with the, with the grid? Um, the floating <laughs> IPs are done in this section over State here. Maintenance. How about maintenance and upgrades? How about um, managing that entire process of That's a great question. deployments? Yeah, thanks, Chris. The, so today, you just pick a node. And you can click view change log, and you can and, and we're very transparent about everything that we do in engineering. Every single ticket that gets opened translates into a line of, of information inside the change log. So every bit of egg on our face with every bug, uh, every fix that we make, every new feature, it goes into the change log. And so that's right out on the public internet. There's no like password protection. You can go in there and see everything that we do. Um, if you click check for updates, what it's going to do is go out to our package server, see if there's a new version available, and then it'll show you what you're currently on, and then the latest version that's available, you just click OK and it upgrades the node. So where that's going next is with 5.0, uh, we're working on making it so you just select all the boxes in the grid and click OK, and it will just go and upgrade them all and uh, do that in a parallelized uh, fashion. So you don't need to, uh, to reboot. Uh, unless there was a kernel upgrade, and if there's a kernel upgrade, you don't need to reboot until you you uh, until you want to, like a maintenance window. But there's no downtime because if it's a ZFS based pool and you reboot a box, the pool is going to move to the other one, and so the users are not going to have lost any access to their storage. When that comes back up, you just push the pool back to the other node that it was on, and then reboot the next box, and so on and so forth. So after we have like the grid scale auto upgrade, then the, the next phase of that is, is sort of like doing the auto reboots and coordinating all of that for the users as well. So that does, you know, upgrade of the product uh, and, and then there's security patches get, that get applied and, uh, and then of course uh, occasionally a kernel upgrade. So anyways, this is being revised a bit for version five to kind of just make it a little bit, you know, just sort of global scale, grid how scale. Can, how much intelligence is it in that? Because if you look at it this week, it's, uh, I'm not the deep yeah. visualization gathering, but I seem to remember that um, the data space sphere upgrade broke the number of number of what I saw. So it would be nice to be able to say, don't do this, or we're not going to even let you do this, because yeah. if you do this, we can see that you're in vain, we'll stop you doing it. Um, yeah. Until we know that that's been upgraded. Are you, are you going to get into that level of saying, um, we've spotted you've got this type of disk drive, this type of NVMe, or you use that type of driver, or some other sort of thing that says if you upgrade it, your system's going to degrade or break or whatever. Are you going to go to that level, do you think? We, we have done some things like that in the past where um, when we did a full platform upgrade from, we used Ubuntu server underneath when we went from like 12 to 14. Um, the cluster components completely changed everything. And so what we did there was block it, give them an alert, and then say, please contact support for assistance. So yeah, when real <coughs> oddities come in and it's going to affect that customer's uh, particular deployment, then we, we, we try to block those things. Uh, um, but yeah. I'm also curious, how do you um, keep up with all those updates on the open source stuff, the, the yeah. ZFS, the... Yeah. So we curate our own version of ZFS. It's basically the same as what you get in the open source, but um, we can't risk uh, having you know problems. Uh, so it's focused on robustness and quality. And so when a new release comes out into the open source, like something that's cutting ble you know bleeding edge, we don't pull that into the product. And so it comes in uh, into our lab and gets used, and, and we eat our own dog food some, for some period of time. And it also bakes out the open source for a while. The security updates we take almost instantly. Yeah. So if there's a, a kernel update that's required to handle Spectre and Meltdown and all that, it comes in right away. So we, we, um, we are very active in terms of, uh, uh, of you know, security rate related items, but cutting edge features take way backseat to you know, stability mm -hmm. and all of that. So but, but you are using the same or a version <coughs> below that of, for example, set. Yes, we use Luminous today, Luminous, um, with the Blue Store capabilities. That's the that's what is um, uh, what what we're uh, putting into 4.7 and then into 5.0. Uh, 
uh, and, uh, and then we'll eventually be up to mimic. Uh, but uh, the, uh, what was I gonna say? We only use long-term support releases of Ubuntu, and we're working on bringing the platform to Red Hat uh, and CentOS because we find that there's a lot of large organizations that need to be able to use the security tools that are available on those platforms. And so essentially Quantastore is sort of, you know, a lot of the components just will instantly port like all the user interface and backend pieces uh, for the user interface will instantly port. Um, where we have a little bit more work to do is uh, the core services in C++ uh, and it knows how to talk to uh, the network configuration elements of Ubuntu today, it just needs to be updated to handle the network configuration elements of Red Hat. So it'll go pretty quickly at this stage because we've already gotten gotten past all like the system D uh, conversion the stuff. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that once we kind of have things packaged as RPMs and all that, then it makes a sense to go and, and, and provide it. Uh, on some other platforms. It all depends on what, what we see in terms of market demand. Right. But there's very clear demand for uh, for CentOS and Red Hat. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, the I think all yeah all those tasks are are, uh, are done, and so uh, the last bit is just creating the pools of storage. And uh, you go here, and if you're gonna use it with OpenStack, we can create some pools for the block storage, the RBDs. You don't have to do it at this stage, um, but if you just check that box, it'll go and create a, a few more pools. This here is actually a group of pools that get created in order to deliver S3 storage. We're gonna choose erasure coding, um, and, uh, and that's it. So we just click okay, and that's gonna set up uh, the S3 storage access uh, for us. So those three dialogues are basically setting up Ceph, but you know when you are after you've deployed Ceph, what about adding a new box? Uh, what about uh, adding uh, and changing which you, which box you want as the Ceph monitor? What about adding another Rados gateway for S3 access? All of that are just buttons. You just say, hey, I want another uh, S3 gateway on such and such a box. Uh, I want to go and add to the, a member to the cluster. Um, I want to add a monitor. I want to remove a monitor. All those things that create risk for the administrator. You know, they don't. You know, when you go and set up, uh, you know, everything at the command line, you don't want to. It's just like they don't touch it. They don't want to even breathe on it, right? It's just it's stable. They don't want to take any chances on anything. Uh, with Quantastore, they don't have to worry about that. It's just going to do the right thing. You want to add a monitor? You click the button. It adds a monitor. So it just completely de-risks the whole deployment and, and utilization of these advanced open source technologies. So it takes a minute for this to go and do the, the object uh, storage, the, the setting that up. Um, but I think uh, I'll just pop back to, because this is going to take a little while, I'll just pop back to my last couple of slides, kind of give you a little bit of a view of, of, our, of our roadmap. Uh, yeah, two slides here. So this is um, this is kind of what the hardware looks like when we do these deployments. Sorry, this uh, apologize. I, I messed up this slide. This is supposed to show some HDSC JBODs here, but I think I I, I foobarred this uh, this slide. But typically, you'll see all flash configurations like this with some attached SAS uh, flash uh, JBODs to a pair of head units. Here we would see like, like the, the large JBODs connected to a pair of, of units. And then the scale out, like the Ceph configurations like we did here, we did three nodes, but they were virtual machines rather than physical servers today. Um, and those are kind of, that's how we do it. Uh, and again, all of these can be managed in the same grid. So you could have an all flash storage pool and uh, uh, a big archive config and uh, object storage all in the same thing. And those can be in, in, in different data centers. So where we're headed, um, that's the, I need to erase this line because, yeah, Chris, Chris corrected me. Not the first SDS solution to do all of these things, but some of these things perhaps, and especially in conjunction across a, a distributed grid that's, that's managing systems across all these, uh, 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 you know, across the enterprise. Um, so like as an example, like a nimble box is, is a box, you can kind of group things together to make a cluster. Quantastore is really the manager of clusters of clusters. Um, we're, the Ceph Luminos uh, is, is coming in the next release with, with, and in Quantastore 5, 
We've done a lot of work with Hewlett Packard around NVDIM integration, so we can use that with the Ceph configurations to go and again accelerate performance to the use of, of this uh, advanced um, DIM technology. So super low latency, very, very fast uh, for, in, uh, and it proves the right, basically the right performance of the whole solution. Um, I, I haven't talked much about it, but uh, you were asking about data migration earlier. Somebody's got a NetApp, how do they go bring the data over to Quantastore? So we built these backup policies right into the product. So you can just go take any folder within Quantastore and put a backup policy on it and say, go back up my NetApp and point it to a folder or pack up this Windows box or back up that Linux server. It'll connect to it over NFS or SMB and drive backups. But we've run into some customers that need that to go and just synchronize. Like, all right, well, I'm going to put new files on the Quantastore box and I'm going to put them on my NetApp box and I need you to push the new files in both directions. So we're adding a bi-directional sync mode that was requested by a customer in the media entertainment space. Um, they are doing this on AWS, and so one of the other things that you need in AWS is uh, when you reboot devices today and they're NVMe, they throw away all your data. And they have persistent storage for other types of storage like the EBS, but when you have these dedicated NVMe devices and you reboot, everything just poof, it's gone. So what they really need is a pool of storage that will rebuild itself afterwards. And so that's what our ephemeral storage pool technology is going to do. And then... Uh, NVMe, we do that today with uh, all of our scale out storage, but we don't want to leave scale up storage out of this picture because that's our super low latency SAN NAS. So how do you do that with NVMe? We're working with some hardware vendors that are de developing NVMe where it's like a cluster in a box. And with SAS, that was that, that you had two ports on every hard drive so you could connect to one server and the other with the same disk drive and share it and then you could do failover. So that's how uh, IO fencing and all of that works with SCSI. There's ways to do that now with NVMe, and so we're, we're tying in with that to go and produce flash-based solutions that can do over a million IOPS. And then we're doing a bunch of work on, uh, on Cinder to upgrade our, our uh, Kubernetes, Docker, and Cinder modules uh, for ZFS-based uh, storage pools. Any, any questions on some of the... Some of the There's no dates, target dates, so what's the... Yeah, um, a lot of this is going to ship before the end of the year. Uh, I think that uh, the ZFS, Kubernetes, and Docker driver, this will probably go into, into Q1, like January or February. Yeah. So speaking of that last bullet, is that the container storage interface or something else? Yeah, so this is exactly, so when you want to go and provision block storage for a Docker uh, that um, container that's persistent between restarts of the Docker container and all that. Yeah, this, that's exactly what that's for. We did a plugin for a framework called Flocker that didn't really catch on, and so now we're rebuilding it uh, for uh, just the native Docker volume driver. So, yeah. Uh, and then on the topic of NVDIMs, um, I'm a little confused why you're locking yourself in, or apparently so, to a given vendor. No, and by the, the way, they don't one. make NVDIMs, you know that. Yeah. Other people do. Yeah. And then there's PMM.io, and there's a lot of yeah. open source support for that rather than, you know, tying yourself to a given platform vendor. It, it, it isn't. It's just the first place where we're, where we're starting. So we did, they, 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 their engineering team worked with us to go and really prove that technology out. But we are using the standard PMM drivers that are available in Linux. So when we go and, and bring that to other uh, server platforms, it's going to use all the same work that we did. So it's, it, it'll translate, yeah. There's not like specific it, HP elements in the platform just to pull that together. Well, but it and is, I hope you're not paying their OEM prices for NVDIMs either, just saying. Uh, no, they, they provided us with the lab equipment. They've just been fantastic. They've got a really talented team there working on the NVDIM tech and, and bring it all together. So, yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. I know that we're out of time. and. Um, Hope you enjoyed the demo. You've got my contact information, so if there's anything else I can answer or uh, just uh, send me an email, happy to help.